Hello and welcome. My name is Sam Wiley, and this is the introductory session for the Finance Education for Investors course. So the purpose of this introductory session is to demonstrate the content, the level, the style, the quality of the Finance Education for Investors course. And to do that, we're going to proceed as follows. First of all, I'm just going to talk about myself for about a minute, and then we're going to plunge right into the middle of the course and start talking about investment strategy. It's just unhelpful in a showcase video like this to go methodically class from class through the course. Now, we will do that. We will cover all of the content of the course. But first of all, we're going to talk about investment strategy. And then we're going to zoom out a bit, quite a bit, to talk about investment process. And then we will go back and talk about all of the components of the course. But first of all, let me just tell you a bit about myself. So I studied engineering at the University of Western Australia, where I met my beautiful wife, Tracy. And Tracy and I moved to Canberra for both of us to work for the federal government. And then we moved to London. I had a scholarship. I'd studied a master's degree in economics at the ANU. And I worked at the ANU, taught at the ANU for a bit. And then I won a scholarship uh, to do a PhD at the London Business School from Solomon Brothers. Uh, Tracy and I went to London. We were there for four and a half years. Then we moved to the States after I finished my PhD. I was a junior professor at Dartmouth for seven years. And then in 2004, we returned to Australia. Uh, and since then, I have been a principal fellow at the Melbourne Business School. Now, as well as being an academic, I've worked with very many companies over time. So I've worked with global banks uh, like UOB and Citi and, and Merrill Lynch and the like, and, and lots of corporates. As well as that, I've done uh, quite a bit of media, I've written occasionally for The Australian, done a lot of media with the, with the ABC, and, and I write fairly regularly for The Australian Financial Review. So as I said, now let's go into looking at investment strategy. We're just going to plunge right into this. And strategy is always about positioning, but investment strategy is about positioning and structuring and tax and risk. And we're going to see in a minute that this is the what, the where, and the how of investment strategy. So let's start off with the what, the positioning part. And positioning means choosing how much of your money to put into different asset classes. These are all different asset classes. Australian shares, global shares, real estate, which includes residential real estate, like apartments and houses, as well as commercial real estate, like shopping centers and office towers and industrial parks. And then fixed income, which means bonds, infrastructure, which means all of the shared productive assets of the economy, like roads and airports and cloud computing centers and electricity networks, uh, et cetera. That's a fantastic asset class in these times of returning inflation. And then private equity, this is the ownership of shares outside of the public markets. So these uh, Australian shares are listed on the Australian Securities Exchange in Sydney, and global shares are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, the Mumbai Stock Exchange, the Tokyo Stock Exchange, um, et cetera. But private equity is not listed on stock exchanges. That's a fantastic asset class um, as well. And we'll talk a bit about hedge funds uh, in just a minute. And then, of course, every investor needs to have some uh, liquidity to, to hold some cash. Now, as well as choosing positioning across these asset classes, how much money to invest in all of these asset classes. Then there's positioning within asset classes uh, as well. And we could take an example from real estate. So for instance, we might want to position ourselves in apartments, or we might want to position ourselves in houses on the outskirts of the city or houses in the inner part, the leafy suburbs of the city. We might want to be in a remote location, like Port Hedland or Alice Springs, we might want to be in a regional location like Ballarat or Wollongong, um, Albury, Wodonga, um, et cetera. All of that is about positioning within the asset class as, across, as opposed to across asset classes. Now, most likely you don't know what all of these asset classes are. Of course, we're at the beginning of something here, at the beginning uh, of the beginning. Uh, these things are all fully explained uh, in the course. Now, I should also say that Typically in finance, there's three names for everything. So when I talked about Australian equities just then, I might just as easily have said shares or stocks. Equities, shares, stocks, they're all the same thing. When we come to dividend imputation, we'll be talking about franking credits, dividend imputation, corporate tax credits, all the same thing. 
or we might talk about earnings, net income, net profit, all the same thing. For some reason in finance, everything has to have clean names. Now, to begin with, that's confusing, but eventually it's actually very empowering to have facility with all those terms. And that's what comes out uh, in the course because we use those terms interchangeably, we gain a lot of facility with the terms and, and it breaks down the impenetrability of the language of finance. So it's actually, that's a very helpful thing. So in any case, the what of strategy is positioning across asset classes within asset classes. And then we need the where. So where are we gonna hold the assets and stream cash flows through? Now, that jargon of holding assets and streaming cash flows through, I'll explain that more in just a moment, but you can see that one structure that we might own shares in is in our superannuation, in an industry fund, or in a self-managed super fund, or a retail fund, or a corporate or government fund. There's lots of different types of superannuation funds, and you have to choose one. And we talk about that in great detail in the course. But that's a structure. These are all trusts in which you can hold assets. And then, of course, there's family trusts as well. Or we might go for direct title, where it's not held within a structure, but held directly. That would typically be with negative gearing, for instance. So a way of explaining this structuring and tax a little bit better is to, is to have a look at this diagram and to see that to go from today into the future and to grow our wealth, we typically grow our wealth or almost exclusively grow our wealth in one of these five ways. And we can think of these as different structures. So people accumulate wealth, equity in their home by paying down their mortgage. And then they might want to use that equity later on for investments. They might want to to get a, an equity loan uh, against their mortgage. They might want to draw down the equity in their mortgage when they're in retirement, for instance, using the pension loan scheme. We talk about all of those things in the course, but, but households accumulate wealth by paying down the mortgage. Maybe they buy another house, a nicer house, and pay down that mortgage as well. Some people get stuck here and never move on to, to these more important parts, uh, or these other parts, I should say, rather than more important parts. Of course, everyone has to have super because that's compulsory. Um, the 10% of income up to 27,500, that's the concessional part of super. And then there's the after-tax non-concessional part of super. Or you might choose to, to put your surplus savings instead of paying down the mortgage or putting extra money into super. It might be that you want to negatively gear some assets, borrow to invest in assets, assets that that where the interest is more than the income generated from the asset. Now that's typically housing, but it can be shares as we'll talk about in the course, but it's typically housing. So we buy a house in a leafy suburb and then the net rent on the house doesn't cover the interest. And so the net rent minus the interest, that's the loss. We put the loss together with other sources of income, typically our salary. And that's negative gearing. And we'll see what negative gearing as a leveraging and as a tax strategy. It's very important to understand the, the nature of the tax strategy of negative gearing. But that's another option and very popular option. A more underdone option is for people to invest using family trusts. Family trusts have got fantastic advantages in being able to distribute income and capital gains to members of the family who've got the lowest incidence of tax and, and also for for asset protection, um, for people protecting their assets from being sued, um, for instance. But family trusts, as I said, there's 450,000 in Australia, but there probably should be more um, than that. And of course, people can own a business, you might buy a franchise, for instance, start a business or grow a business. These are the five principal ways of growing wealth into the future. And you can see that they involve different structures, where to put your wealth. And, and that's what we mean here in structuring and tax part, the, the what, the where, and the how of investment strategy. Now the how part is how to manage risk, how to bring extra risk in by borrowing to invest. So borrowing, leverage, gearing um, of investment. You can see that there's three words for everything in finance. That's bringing extra risk in, extra risk and extra return. And insurance and hedging and diversification, they're all ways of taking risk out. And these things go together. And so we need to think through clearly how to manage risk. Now, the way that I've presented it here, it looks as if 
investment strategy is about positioning and then thinking about structuring and tax planning and then thinking about how to manage risk. But that's not correct. These things, the three things have to be done together, have to be jointly decided. And it's done in an iterative process. So we start here, try to make this work, try to make that work, start again. Having learned something in the first iteration, start again to, to, until we get all three of these things working together. Strategy is always an iterative process. So corporate strategy within businesses is, is always a, an ongoing and an iterative um, process. And it is an embedded investment strategy as well. And it's about getting these three things, the what, the where, and the how, uh, to work together properly. Now, let's just take a couple of examples here. So for instance, let's say that we bought a rental apartment, and it might be that the gross yield on this rental apartment is 4.6%. And after we take out expenses, like the like insurance, like um, uh, taxes, like the agent's fees, uh, et cetera. We get down to a net rent of about 3.6%. And then we have some, some leverage over here. So we borrowed 50% of the value of the property, but that's gonna make it overall uh, positive cash flow. The, the rent is going to exceed the interest payments over here. Because it's positive cash flow, and we want to distribute the cash flows and ultimately the capital gains to family members who can uh, absorb those with, without paying too much tax, then we would want to hold this in a family trust. So you can see here the what, the where, and the how of this investment. Those three things have got to go together. Now, we decided not to leverage it up too much because of the risk that we, that we want to take, and we want it to be positive cash flow, we know where we want to hold it in a family trust because it is positive cash flow. Now, negative gearing would be a different example. Here, we're going to hold it outside of super and outside of a family trust or a corporation. It's going to be direct title held by a couple, for instance, maybe 50-50, and with a lot of leverage because we want to create losses as a tax strategy, which we'll talk about a lot in the course. And we're buying a house in a leafy suburb. So why do I say leafy, house in a leafy suburb? Well, let's talk about that part of the strategy and positioning uh, when we get on the course. But this is going to be low yield. This is going to be a net yield of between 1.5 and 1.7% of the value of the house. And so when we take out interest, we're going to have quite a significant loss. And so we're going to want to put that against our salaries, or maybe the, the two salaries of the, of the couple, if it's a couple. Then, and to do that, we have to hold it outside of the structure and have direct ownership. So these three things have to go together, the type of asset, structure that we hold it in, the amount of leverage that we're going to have. Same thing down here, we might own high yielding shares in a family trust without too much debt. Borrowing to invest in shares is, is fairly aggressive. We, we talk about it a lot um, in the course, uh, nonetheless. So those are examples of what I mean by the what, the where, and the how of investment strategy. So now let's look, zoom out a bit, as I said, and start talking about investment process. So investment strategy, as we'll see in just a moment, is a part of investment process. Investment process is a, is a higher level thing. So let's zoom out a bit and start talking about investment process before we talk about all of the components um, of the course. So the first thing in investment process, in the ongoing investment process, is to set goals is to write down your goals. Most people have never written down their goals. I bet that you've never written down your goals. Um, it's, it's the most common thing is for people to never have really thought through and written down their goals. Often people kid themselves that they know what their financial goals are, but until you write them down, they're not complete and coherent. And, and you can't get them really vivid in your mind, which is so essential for moving towards them. So first step, uh, working out and writing down of goals. And, and people's goals typically come down to some combination of these and, and other things, but especially some combination of these. Buying property, educating children, and educating grandchildren um, as well, if they have children. Retirement age, in this example, uh, 67 years old. Um, percentage of income in retirement. So property, education of children, uh, retirement income, launching children into the property market. That's become a much more common thing as, it's be, as the property market's moved up so much in value. Having enough money at an advanced age um, for aged care and for security. 
and also for charitable giving. People want to leave money to their kids, but they also want to do good works. Now, to bring about those goals, choices have to be made. And these are the most important choices. So how much to save? And a really critical issue is, are you saving enough to reach your goals? And this is something that we go through in, in, as part of the 10-step program of working out what's right and what's wrong about your investing. So we have a calculator for that purpose, and we work out uh, whether you're saving enough. So how much to save, that's a crucial thing. Asset allocation, meaning where you have invested, uh, this is the what of investment strategy, how much money you've put into these different asset classes. Now we're taking a, an example here of asset allocation. Well, let's think of an example of an investor who has a million dollars outside of the ownership of their family home. So why do we put it outside the ownership of the family home? Well, we'll come to that um, on the course and we certainly don't ignore the ownership of the family home. That's so important for being able to borrow, to invest in other things, to accumulate wealth, to position on the risk spectrum, to have stability and value, uh, to draw down on uh, in retirement. But here in the asset allocation process, we do look, at, first of all, at, at wealth outside of the, of the family home, investable wealth, as we would say, and the allocation across these different asset classes. Let's, let's say that there's a million dollars outside the ownership of the family home, the ownership of a home, and we've got 25% in Aussie shares, 30% in global shares. So this is someone who's got quite an appetite for risk, of course and then 25% into real estate. What I'm thinking of here is just to take an example is that they bought an apartment, which is worth $750,000, and they borrowed $500,000 for that purpose. So there's $500,000 of the bank's money and 750,000 total. So 250,000, 25% is of their, of their investable wealth is the equity in the real estate. Now, of course, they have more exposure than that. They will have all of the gains or any potential losses on the ownership of the property, most likely gains, especially if they hold it for some period of time. So they have more exposure than the 25%, but the allocation here is the 25% part. Fixed income means bonds. Uh, this is an investor who's looking for some risk, uh, so they don't have a lot of, of bonds. Infrastructure, as I was saying before, fantastic asset class, same with private equity. The reason that I put a cross through hedge funds here is not because we should rule out hedge funds. It's just that direct investment in hedge funds uh, is very difficult for investors unless they have vast amounts of wealth, unless they, they have a family office and many hundreds or billions of dollars. The best hedge funds go to the people with the most money. So that means the Aussie supers and the future funds and the, and the, the big retail funds of the world, especially the big industry funds and, and the like. Aussie Super has $250 billion to invest. So of course, the hedge funds go to them first, and then they go to the billionaires, they go to the Gina Reinhardts and the, and the Scott Farquhars of the world. And, and by the time they make their way down to you and me, many thousands of people have, have rejected them. The, the best ones have been taken up by the people with the most money, the institutional investors like Aussie Super, and then the very, very wealthy families. And it's what's left over that makes its way down uh, to private investors like you and me. And so you end up paying large fees and not getting good performance. It's just a, a bad deal to invest directly in hedge funds. That doesn't mean it's not a good idea to invest in hedge funds. You just need to do it through someone else, like Aussie Super, for instance, or one of the other uh, uh, really good industry funds, like Host Plus or Q Super or Sun Super or Uni Super, um, et cetera. They, have, they get the first crack at the best hedge funds and they have good investment teams who can evaluate which are the best hedge funds. So in any case, amongst our choices which need to be made to reach our goals, first thing, how much to save. Second thing, now we're into strategy. This is the what of strategy, asset allocation. And leverage, of course, is the how of strategy. Leverage and insurance are the how of strategy about managing risk. And then down here, we have structuring and tax planning, which is the where of strategy. And you'll see why I've separated these uh, parts of, of strategy in just a moment. But implementation's an absolutely crucial thing here for us. So investments have to be implemented. It's not enough for us to work out a strategy. That strategy has to be implemented. Let's take the example of the strategy of investing in high yielding shares, meaning shares, Australian shares that pay high dividends. 
like Fortescue Metal Group or, or um, National Australia Bank, uh, Tabcorp, et cetera. So a portfolio of high dividend paying, high yielding, high income um, Australian shares held in the family trust with some borrowing to invest. Okay, well, that's the strategy. That's the what, the high yielding Aussie shares. That's the where in the family trust. That's the how. So bringing in some risk by leveraging up the investment in this case takes quite, you know, you really have to have quite an appetite for this to borrow to invest in shares, but that's our example um, here. But that doesn't implement the strategy. You know, to implement, we have to make decisions about are we going to use an exchange traded fund? Are we going to use a listed investment company, a managed fund, et cetera? So we're going to use one of those products which allows us to pool with other investors to implement, to actually bring about the, the investment in shares. Well, are we going to do it directly in a portfolio that's managed just for us? Are we going to open a brokerage account with Comsec or NAB Trade, for instance, and then buy the shares directly or buy the exchange traded funds um, directly? Or are we going to have someone else manage a portfolio for us? Are we going to have a full service broker like JB Weir or Ord Manette or Evans or Shaw or, or Patterson's, um, et cetera? See, all of these are implementation options. And we need to understand that fully. You know, I need to, in the course, take you the full distance here to, so that you have a, a complete investment process, not just strategy, but implementation. You know, that's what it takes for this course to have a lot of impact and impacts what it's all about. If at the end of the course, you think, wow, that was really interesting. And Sam's a, a funny guy. Um, well, I hope you do think that, that would be great. And I'll definitely work towards that. But in a few years time, you will have completely forgotten about that. And what will matter is, do I have a feeling of empowerment in my investing? And do I have a well-functioning investment process that is moving me towards really good returns? Is my wealth growing faster than it would have otherwise? Am I, getting, am I moving towards my, my goals more quickly? Is my wealth going to peak at a higher point? That's what's going to matter. And for that to happen, we need to go the whole distance. We need to have investment strategy and we need to have implementation uh, within the process. So we really concentrate on implementation. It takes a lot of knowledge about products and about the different options for implementation across the different asset classes, shares and, and property and infrastructure and private equity and the like. It takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of the, uh, most of the knowledge in the course is about implementation to make sure that we go the, the full distance, to make sure that we deliver on the promise of empowerment and getting to better outcomes uh, in the course. So in any case, implementation is absolutely vital in choices. And so is making a decision about financial advice. Not everyone needs or wants financial advice, but many people will want a financial advice. And that's part of what we need to work out in the 10-step program of self-examination of your circumstances. So when I say self-examination, I'm gonna give you everything you need to work through this 10-step process. It starts off with setting goals and then positioning on the risk spectrum and then working out what you're invested in at the moment, and then working out whether you're saving enough, and then we go on into strategy. You'll see in just a moment, I'll explain it uh, in a lot of detail, what the 10 steps are, the 10 parts of the 10-step of the program of self-evaluation. I give you everything you need to work that out for yourself. Uh, and not only do I do that because this is education and not financial advice, but, but because that's what you need to carry it forward uh, in time. You know, we really need to have that that 10 step process to bring you, not just to find out what's right and wrong about your investing at the moment and to fix what isn't right, but to bring you up to speed. You know, if I describe an investment process for you, but we don't bring you up to speed on that investment process, it'll just be like a, a train going by. Uh, and that's not what we want. We want by the end of the course for you to have a you know, really well functioning investment process. And we need to bring you up to speed in the 10 step process uh, or a sense of program of self-evaluation. Sounds like, sounds like AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. That's actually a 12-step program. I haven't been on that, um, not yet in any case. Uh, but ours is a 10-step program to bring you up to speed, work out what's right and what's wrong, bring you up to speed uh, in your investing. Now, a part of that is working out whether you need financial advice or not, and we'll come to that. But that's a really significant choice. An investment process is all about setting goals and making choices to bring about your goals. 
Now, a really crucial thing here is that we need to position you on the risk spectrum. You will be positioned somewhere between conservative, not wanting to take very much risk, and aggressive, wanting to have a lot of risk and a lot of return. Low risk, low return, down the left end. High risk, high return, up on, on the right side. Where you are on the risk spectrum, we work through that as a second step in our 10-step program of, of self-evaluation. That just depends upon your individual circumstances. So it'll depend upon the security of your income. So it's a very different thing to be a teacher in a public school or, or maybe a doctor on a long-term contract with a hospital. It's, that's a very different thing in terms of income stability to owning a risky small business or a small or medium-sized business. Now, for, for a risky small or medium-sized business owner, there's enough risk and return in the business. That on, on the money-making side, on the money investing side, which is what we're talking about here, it's about wealth preservation. So in their investing, they're going to be towards the left uh, on, the, on the risk spectrum, that on, on your side of the screen. So towards the left uh, on, the, on the risk spectrum, whereas the stability of income for the teacher or the doctor is going to push them towards the right on the risk spectrum. They have great stability in the making money side, so they can take more risk in the, in, on the investing side. Now, age is important as well. The younger you are, the more time there is to, to work through any downturns in your investing, to make the adjustments, especially in saving, uh, that you need, saving and earning, that you need to, to get back on track to your goal. So you can take more risk. You can, you can adjust. You have more time to adjust. It's also true that the obligations that you have in life are important. Now, I don't mean here normal familial obligations of having parents and having children. I mean ex exceptional, extraordinary obligations. Uh, if you had a child with special needs, for instance, that would be an extraordinary obligation, which would change your position on the risk spectrum, and in particular move you to the left. And then, of course, there is your personality. Are you someone who can take a lot of risk and not sweat it? Uh, or are you the opposite? That's going to position you on the risk spectrum. You can see... But this isn't really a choice that we're talking about here. That's why I didn't put it in the choices. It isn't really a choice. It's a recognition of who you are. You know, how stable is my income? Um, how old am I? You don't have any choice about how old you are, uh, unfortunately, um, or about, uh, about significant obligations in life, extraordinary obligations in life, or about your personality. These, th this is really about recognizing who you are, positioning on the spectrum rather than making choices. But it's absolutely essential for investment to be properly positioned on the risk spectrum because it drives these things. It drives how much risk in. Am I going to be invested in the risky asset classes of shares and property or the less risky asset classes of fixed income and cash? And how much leverage am I going to borrow to invest or not? Holding a lot of cash is, is the opposite of borrowing to invest. Borrowing to invest is taking money out of the bank to invest in shares or property. And of course, having a big deposits in the bank is the opposite to taking money out of the bank. But leverage helps to, to, to move us to the right or left uh, uh, in the total amount of risk that we're taking. And then of course, insurance is risk out. So the, this position on the risk spectrum is really driving uh, very crucial things. And we need to know what it is before we get into strategy. So we need financial goals, and we need a position on the risk spectrum, both of those things, before we start making choices. And there's lots of choices to make. The one that we talked about the most here is asset allocation. We've been talking about the implementation of asset allocation um, as well. But you can see why in the, in the investment process, we concentrate on financial goals and risk spectrum first thing. Now, financial goals, of course, come out of life goals. Money is our servant and not our master. And so we really need money to live the life that we want to live. And so a lot of people find themselves working backwards from here. When they go to write down their financial goals, they realize that they've never uh, really talked through with other people that what, what, it is, what, what is the life that they want to live, to be, to be quite explicit about that. So it can be quite revealing or, or quite a helpful thing. Uh, but in any case, getting to financial goals, explicit and vivid financial goals, positioning on the risk spectrum, moving into choices getting started on investment pro the investment process. Now, another way that we can conceptualize investment process is in terms of long periods of time. 
So we're trying to move to, to goals in the future. You know, we're gonna get our goals vivid um, and move towards them. We're gonna recognize where we are at the moment. Personal circumstances are gonna define where we are in the risk spectrum and look at what we're currently invested in. And often there's, there's a significant disjunction here. The people, and the most common disjunction is that people are not taking as much risk as they should be. That's the most common disjunction. And, and the way that that comes about most commonly is that people spend put too much of their saving over too long a periods of time into paying down their mortgages. But in any case, we'll get to that. We'll get to talking about all of that. But working out the circumstances today, positioning on the risk spectrum and working out what the asset allocation and the leverage of the investor is at the moment. And then moving forward through time from today into the future to meeting of goals with strategy, conceiving and implementing of strategy, and also with financial control, controlling the process. So for instance, knowing whether you're saving enough to reach your goals, that's what I mean by control. Knowing where the money goes, when, when you earn money, where does it basically go in a, in a sort of proper understanding of where the money goes? That's financial control. And also, you might be thinking about, about handing over control to a financial advisor. Financial advice, we can think of as the handing over of, of control. But in any case, investment process, the most important thing for us. Now, just one more thing before we, we go on to a more methodical way of looking uh, at the content of the course. We have, of course, just jumped into investment strategy and investment process here. Just before we go on here, let me, let me put implementation into that diagram, but, but also put investment philosophy into the diagram but, uh, before we go on to um, a more detailed uh, look at what's in the course. So we have here the, the what, where, and how of investment strategy, but we need to implement that strategy, um, of course, the implement the strategy in different asset classes. How are we going to bring our, our share strategy about, our property strategy about, et cetera. And then after we make all of these choices in our investment process to reach our goals, we need something to compare the choices to. We need an investment philosophy. Now, a philosophy of any kind is a set of guiding principles. And that's what an investment philosophy is a set of guiding principles for our investing. To make sure that, that our investing is coherent, meaning that, that all of the bits fit together, that we don't pull in one direction by making one choice and pull in the opposite direction by, by making uh, another, uh, another choice. And also that our investing is consistent through time. And especially during financial crisis. If we have a set of guiding principles, we can always go to them in the financial crisis. Make sure that we don't get blown off course. So many people in the, both the, the GFC, in the dot-com bubble bursting, and then in the GFC, and then in the COVID-19 uh, um, mini crash in, in February, March last year, February, March, April last year, so many people get blown off course during those crises because they don't have a set of principles to go to, to, to make sure that they're staying on track, that we have coherent, meaning fitting together, choices that, that we're consistent through time, especially through, through crises, and also that we rule out really bad choices. You know, we can't all make brilliant choices. We're not Warren Buffett, we can't make brilliant choices all the time, but we can rule out a lot of very bad choices. And, and that makes a huge difference over a lo the, the long journey that is our investing. It makes a big difference to rule out very bad choices. And if you're comparing the choices that you're making in strategy and implementation, to a set of guiding principles, that really helps you to rule out bad choices, to be led astray by bad ideas um, that, that come about um, from time to time. So coherence, consistency through crises, ruling out really bad decisions. We need an investment philosophy uh, in order to achieve that. And we're gonna talk about what our investment philosophy is uh, in just a bit. Okay, so now let me just, so let me just lay out how are we going to go into, having talked about investment process and strategy, let me just lay out here how we're going to go into talking about the overall content. So we'll talk about purpose, and then we'll talk about the, the content that delivers on that purpose. So we've just been talking about investment process, making and implementing investment choices, strategy and, and control, an investment process, 
an investment philosophy, I should say, of guiding principles to compare our choices to, for coherence, to make sure that we, that we don't get blown off course during crises and that we're consistent, to rule out really bad choices uh, as much as possible. The development, the third part of our content, development of the knowledge that we need, especially for implementation, knowledge of markets and of participants in markets like brokers and advisors and banks and real estate agents and the like of, of products and investments and markets, that knowledge, especially for implementation. And then our 10-step program of self-evaluation, both to work out what's working and to identify what's working and what's not working in your investing, but also to bring you up to speed on the investment process so that we don't just have a train going by. Um, so, that, so that by the end of the course, you've got a well-functioning investment process with a proper investment strategy and proper uh, uh, financial control. So the content to deliver on the purpose and then the materials to deliver uh, on the content which delivers on the purpose. And I'm going to talk through these uh, in just a moment, what, what all of these things, what these different parts um, of the materials mean. So here's how we're going to proceed in the, the remaining short time that we have. Uh, investment process, investment philosophy, our 10-step uh, program of self-evaluation. That's where we'll go first. We're going to jump into investment philosophy. We've talked quite a bit about investment process already. Then we will just highlight the knowledge. We'll talk about narratives and cases, the fact that the whole of the course is organized around narratives and cases of real examples. Uh, that's just so much the best way uh, to learn anything is to embed it, embed it into real examples. So we have these three, uh, lots of people, you'll see uh, the, the different uh, fictional narratives we use to embed all of the ideas. And then we'll just go class by class. I'll show you a reference of what's in the course. Now, I need a quick disclaimer here in one sentence. This is, uh, this is education and not financial advice, nothing we're doing here that appears in the course or on the website or any of the materials or in this seminar represents financial advice. It's education. Okay, let's get into it. So the purpose, empowerment is the first thing. So many people feel disempowered in their investing. They feel like there's something really large that they don't know about investing. That's a very sinking feeling, a very empty feeling. They feel like there's something that other people know and that you don't know. And they don't know who to trust to help them with that. And then they, there's, they will make mistakes and, and they don't know how to unwind those mistakes. So those three things, you know, not knowing, not, not having the feeling there's something big you don't know. I don't know who to turn to, to as, as for advice or as a trusted source um, of information. I can't get traction in making my choices. I've made some bad decisions and I can't unwind. Very disempowered. Now, unwinding all of that, ending that feeling of disempowered is a central um, purpose of the course. And then, of course, equally or, or important, getting to better outcomes. So higher returns, wealth peaking at a higher level, reaching your financial goals uh, more quickly. Now, to bring that about, as we were saying, investment process, we've been talking about investment process, making our choices, investment philosophy. Uh, so we're going to look at our, our six-part investment philosophy, uh, which is a low a low-cost value investment philosophy, and we'll go through that in just a moment. All of the knowledge that we need, a 10-step program of self-examination to work out what's right and what's wrong about your investing and to bring you up to speed. Now, in terms of the materials of the course, which is what we really haven't talked about yet, we have 10 two-hour classes. So these two-hour classes run from 7.30 to 9.30 every Tuesday evening, starting from the 5th of October. And so these are live Zoom sessions, so you can, we can see each other if you turn your camera on, um, which a lot of people do and a lot of people don't. Either is good. And, but you can ask questions, and there are lots of questions um, as we go along. And we cover all of the content of the course. And then we have, the, the, then we have video on demand which is the content covered in these classes. Now, the video on demand is a little bit shorter. These videos are a bit shorter um, than the, the classes themselves. And that's because the classes contain questions and they also contain a certain amount of discussion of current events uh, in those two hours. So, you know, the RBA meets or inflation goes up or, or something else um, happens. 
and, and a lot happens at the moment um, with COVID-19 and, and quantitative easing um, and the like, and the massive sort of uh, massively high valuations of equities in the United States, for instance, a lot happens. And so we have an opportunity typically at the beginning of the class uh, to talk about those things. And that doesn't uh, appear uh, in the, the recorded on-demand videos. Um, but so they're just, the videos are just a little bit shorter and it's a good reason for people to come to the classes uh, as opposed to, or as well as uh, watching the on-demand videos. The videos are released at the end of the class each week. So we have a class each week, then the videos are released. We have uh, actually a summary video as well, as well as a, a video that goes for 100 minutes. We have a video that goes for 15 minutes, which is a summary um, of the class. Now we have a very large number of PowerPoint slides. They're, not, they're similar to these slides, but many of them have a lot of text. So it's a, this actually represents a reference. Um, as well as, uh, as the slides that we use in the class. Uh, pretty comprehensive reference. We have a lot of supplementary videos as well. The biggest part of the supplementary videos are videos on structuring and tax planning. So we have 10 videos on structuring and tax planning. So we have two on family trusts, we have two on superannuation, we have two on income tax, one covering income tax, another covering personal income tax, another covering corporate income tax and, and also capital uh, gains tax. We have two on borrowing to invest, borrowing to invest in, in, uh, in, for negative gearing, borrowing to invest in shares, borrowing money and putting it into family trust, borrowing within self-managed super funds. Those are all covered in those two videos. Then we have two videos on professional services businesses uh, and professional services income. Actually one video on professional services income. And then we have another video on, uh, on wills and estate planning. So 10 videos, those videos are made with Brendan Gilley, um, who is the CEO of Prior Gilley, which is an accounting firm uh, in Melbourne. Uh, you, will, you will meet uh, Brendan via those videos. They are 10, 30 minute videos, which are running in the background, one for each class, running in the background to really deepen our knowledge about structuring and tax planning so that we can use those ideas in the class and apply those ideas uh, in the class. But Brendan and I developed those ideas, again, using real examples uh, in that series of videos. Uh, Brendan's a fellow of mine for a long time. He was a student of mine when he did his MBA uh, at the Melbourne Business School. Uh, a very good guy, you'll see. So in any case, we have these supplementary videos uh, in the background. Here we, uh, then we have a learning management system uh, where these videos uh, and, the, and the materials of the course are stored. I can show you uh, what that looks like. I'll be able to bring that up here pretty quickly. There we go. That's me, of course. And that's, it. that's a, a summary video. You can see here we have class one, class two. We have the class slides. We have um, supplementary videos, uh, as well as what I was just talking about with Brendan. We have other supplementary videos. Uh, here, here we have a structuring and tax planning uh, video about superannuation. Maybe that won't pop up as quickly as we want. That's Brendan and I. You know, we worked through a bunch of examples. Um, none of those slides jumped up, but, but what you can't see is that as well as us talking to each other through all of the important ideas, we also worked through a whole lot of examples. So all of the materials that you need are available as well as the live classes, we have a learning management system. You can uh, access those materials uh, at your leisure because uh, they're on that Thinkific. Thinkific is a company that provides that platform uh, for teaching companies uh, like Windlestone. Okay, so we have all of the materials there on Thinkific. We have one-to-one -one discussions uh, between participants in the course and me. Uh, a lot of people choose to speak with me about their investment journey and to ask me questions. These are half hour sessions and people take one or, or maybe two of those sessions during the course, maybe one midway through and one after once they've got everything sorted out in the 10 step program. Not everyone um, does this, um, of course, uh, a lot of participants do, uh, which works out very well. You don't have to say anything um, that isn't, you don't have to do it for starters. Uh, but then you don't have to, to, it isn't about me checking whether you've done your homework. I know that people worry a little bit that it's about that, checking where, where you are in the 10-step program. Uh, and also people are, are quite naturally reluctant 
So you talk about their own personal circumstances. It isn't about that. It's an opportunity to talk about your investment journey, where you've been, where you're going, to ask any questions. And a lot of participants find that um, very helpful. Um, and I like it too. It's good. Okay, not that it's all about me, of course. Okay, so here we have our material supplementary, uh, the one-on-one -on -one discussions, which are organized through Calendly. I know it's tedious to be uh, directed to people's Calendly accounts, but it's not really any other way uh, for us to organize. Now we're gonna go in and look at investment philosophy, and then we'll go through these other parts. So let's jump in here. You can see that we have a six part investment philosophy. Remember that these are guiding principles. This is low cost, value investment philosophy. Now low cost and value are not the same thing. Value isn't a repetition of low cost. Low cost refers to low transaction costs and low fees. Minimizing fees and minimizing the cost of buying and selling things, transaction costs. That's the low cost. The value part is value versus growth. And so investors are typically value investors or growth investors. Warren Buffett is famously a value investor. And a lot of academic research, really high quality academic research, has shown that value investing has delivered higher returns um, over time across asset classes, across shares and bonds and real estate, and across countries, uh, in almost every country over time. Value investing has delivered higher returns than growth investing. What's the difference between value and growth? Well, we're gonna to come to that, uh, of course, on the course. But this is an example, relying upon really high quality academic research, is an example of part of our investment philosophy, which is evidence-based decision-making. Uh, the sixth part of our investment, basing where possible decisions on evidence. Um, there's plenty of examples. Another example would be that industry funds are a lot better than retail funds, uh, as I'll explain to you in the first course, in, in the first class. And that's based on really high quality research. And, and, it's, uh, and the reasons for it are, are very well understood, as I'll um, explain to you. But in any case, a, a low cost value investment philosophy with these different components, understanding the sources of value and comparing choices to that, diversification, not putting all your eggs in one basket to eliminate risk, really the only free lunch in finance, keeping fees of any kind, fees that you pay to advisors, the cost of buying and selling, of course, taxes, minimizing these things is, is really important getting advice from experts and not people who charge you a lot of money for their opinion or for handholding, avoiding complexity. Complexity is not your friend as an investor. Complexity is a great way to hide fees and to hide risk. And, and you know, if, you, if, if in a product you can't see where the risk went, well, you've got it, but you just don't realize it. You're bearing it, but you don't realize it. It's a brilliant way to hide fees and to hide risk. And if you avoid com complexity completely, you miss out on almost nothing as a private investor. Um, but the thing you do miss out on is hidden fees and hidden risk. Now, there is an exception to that, which is hybrid notes. Hybrid notes are complex, but they have very good properties for private investors like you and me. And when we get to fixed income, I'm gonna completely unpack hybrid notes. And you'll see, you'll see how that works, how that works. I taught the risk management, the financial engineering um, course um, at the Melbourne Business School for many years. Uh, so. I can say without a hint of modesty, I really know how that works. So I'm going to unpack hybrid notes for you and show you in, in really easily understood ways how they work to get rid of the complexity, and then you'll feel comfortable with investing in them if they, if they suit your circumstances. So that's our exception to avoiding complexity, but it's, a, but it's an important one because of the good properties of hybrid notes. Now, I only really want to go into sources of value part here. Uh, to just give you a flavor for what we mean by investment philosophy. So let's just go into that. And even before I do that, I just want to talk through this very simple example. Now, this is, this, is, this is really starting from the beginning with this example and talking about what we mean by total returns, capital gain and income being the components of total return. And what does a return mean in any case? Now, I'm giving you this example to demonstrate to you that we really do start from the beginning. If you're thinking, I can't take the course because I don't know a lot about finance already. You don't need to, right? We're gonna start right from the beginning. I've been a teacher for, um, for a very long time. I've won the teaching award at the Melbourne Business School 12 times, more than anyone ever. Um, entirely immodest to say that, probably shouldn't have said that. But nonetheless, I think it's okay in this context. But in any case, in my experience in teaching, which is obviously working out pretty well, 
in my experience in teaching, if you start the course above the level of what people know, they don't, that will never, that gap will never close. And so we, we simply have to start at the level of knowledge that people have. And I'm not assuming that you know anything about finance. But there's this challenge at business school, no matter whether you're studying finance, whether you're, whether you're a, a lecturer in finance or in strategy or operations or human resources or marketing or whatever, there's this challenge that you have people who know quite a lot about the subject and people who know nothing about it. So in finance courses, you have people who know nothing about finance in the introductory finance courses. And then you have people who studied finance at, at, uh, as undergraduates and then went to work for banks for seven or eight years before they came to business school and know quite a lot about finance. And the challenge is to bring the people who know nothing along quickly and keep the people who know quite a lot about finance engaged until we're at a sufficient level where we can move together, we move forward together quickly. And keeping people engaged is about explaining it in ways that they haven't heard before, which ends up connecting quite a lot of dots. And it's a challenge to do that, but you know, that's, a, that's, that's what it is to work hard on becoming a really good uh, business school teacher. And, that, and that's what we bring to this course. Uh, I don't assume that you know really anything about finance. What I do assume is that you are ambitious, hardworking, and intelligent. Uh, you know, too hardworking, it's not a lot of work, but ambitious, hardworking, and intelligent. And I don't mean Einstein level intelligent, I mean just garden variety intelligent like the rest of us. So that's what I do assume, but I don't assume, A, that you can remember any mathematics um, from high school, uh, and B, that you know anything about finance. So don't worry about that at all. And this is a demonstration of that. So, but we do go quickly. Now we do have to cover a lot of material. Start from the beginning, but then we go quickly. Okay, so here's an example. Let's say that you put $20 today, zero years, that's today, $20 today into the buying of a share. The share after a year has gone up by $2. That's a capital gain of 10%. So the $2 capital gain is 10% of the initial investment. And that's down here, 10% capital gain. Now let's say that we get income at the end of the year, a dividend of $1, well, that's 5% of the $20. Now, as you may know, dividends are paid every six months in Australia, every three months in the United States. We have an interim dividend and a final dividend. I'm just ignoring that for this purpose and assuming that it's all paid at the end of the year, just to keep it simple for starters. So a $1 dividend at the end of the year, 5% of our initial investment of $20. So now our total return is the capital gain and the income summing to 15% as a simple example. Now let's keep going with returns here and think about what the sources of value are in those returns. You know, if instead of looking backwards and realizing that the gain over the last year had been 15%, we were looking forwards instead and thinking about what kind of return are we expecting over the next year? Not what kind of return did we get over the last year, but what kind of return are we expecting over the next year? Well, we can equally say, what, how much return are investors going to demand for holding the share? Now, let's say that we're thinking about investing in BHP shares, and then we're going to look at an example from residential property, and then we'll look at another investment opportunity. And what we'll see in the course is that the return that people, investors demand for holding BHP shares is of three kinds, has three parts. First of all, they need to get the return they can get for, for not taking any risk or providing any liquidity. Come back to liquidity in a minute. But the return they could get for someone else using their money, the return they could get if they just put their money in the bank or lent it to the federal government. Let's take that. What could I get? It's a long-term investment. So if instead of investing in BHP shares, I put my money into 10-year government bonds, lent it to the federal government, what return would I get year by year? Well, we can actually see that. So here we can see that if we go to to a public source of information. Here you can see I've gone to Bloomberg, uh, bloomberg.com, and I've made my way through the rates and bonds uh, heading to Australia. Could have gone to Germany or the US, but we've gone to Australia here, which is what we're interested in. And we're interested in 10-year government bonds. You can see the yield on 10-year government bonds today, or actually right now, is 1.3%. So that's all you get. 1.3% per year. That's, these are very, very low figures. Not quite historically low, but, but not much above it. 
Now, the reason I did that, went to that website, was to, to show you that we go to a lot of public sources of information. So we go to, to Bloomberg and Morningstar and to the Reserve Bank and to the Australian Securities Exchange, et cetera. I show you the easily accessible sources of information that'll help you as an investor and explain what they are. Uh, I don't assume you know anything about them. Just explain what they are when we get there. We saw that, that, that this is 1.3%, but I'm just going to use a more typical figure for my example. If we were doing this for real, then we would use 1.3%. But I'm just going to use 3%, which is a more typical figure. So investors need 3% because that's what they get for lending the money to the federal government. Then they need something for the riskiness of BHP shares. So why 6.5% per year? Well, that's a historical figure. We start off by looking back into history to get an estimate of how much investors should expect in the future. We look back into the past, and then we make adjustments for current circumstances. The current circumstances of very low real interest rates, which I'll explain on the course, uh, or the current circumstances of quantitative easing, again, something to explain. But we look back into history, historical returns, and then we adjust for current circumstances to, to think about what are we expecting as extra return for investing in large Australian shares. And then there's a liquidity premium as well. And what this refers to, the liquidity premium, let me talk about that down here when we come to residential property. And we'll see why it's zero for BHP. And because of that, we're expecting 9.5%. Investors who need more than 9.5% for investing in BHP, well, they're the ones who don't own the shares. And investors for whom 9.5% is enough, they're the ones who do own the shares. Now, let's have a look at residential property. Same thing, long-term investment. So we need to get at least what we could get for putting our money with the federal government by buying long-term treasury bonds. Shares aren't, the property's not as risky as shares. People make it riskier by borrowing a lot to invest in property. They leverage up, they gear it up um, to make it riskier and, and earn higher returns. Um, but, but just without leverage, property's not as risky as uh, as shares, and so investors don't expect or receive as high returns after the time value of money here as a risk premium. But they do want something for liquidity. And the reason they need an extra bit of uh, extra return every year for liquidity is there's a couple of reasons. Now, here we can see the first of these reasons. And the first of these reasons is they need to get back the round trip cost of buying and selling the property. Let's imagine that. We're in Victoria, just to take an example, where, where I know what the stamp duty, stamp duty is different state by state, but I know that in Victoria, for properties over a million dollars, it's 5.5%. So let's just say we're in Victoria and we've got a property over a million dollars. We buy it and six months later, we sell it, just to take a stylized example. Doesn't matter how long it takes for us to sell it. We still need to get back the cost of buying and then selling. Let's say we buy it, six months later, we sell it. How much of our wealth is, how much of, of the, what we paid is chewed up? Well, 5.5% gets chewed up, gets used up as stamp duty, goes to the federal government, goes to the state government, a big part. And then maybe 2% for the broker, if we negotiate hard with the broker, and then maybe a half percent for legals and to, to, to settle the transaction. So 8% gets consumed in the round trip cost of buying and then selling. Something gets consumed in the round trip cost of buying and selling any asset, any uh, uh, investment asset. And if we just assume we hold it for eight years, that these properties get held for eight years, on average, properties in Australia get held for 9.3 years. I've worked quite a lot with property data. Um, but let's just go with eight years, keep it simple. Then we need 1% per year. We need to amortize this 8%. We need to get our 8% back year by year. So we need the round trip cost divided by the expected holding period. We need an extra 1% per year. And actually, it'll be more than that because we need something for the inconvenience of our money being locked up. Uh, and you know, the more illiquid the asset, so for instance, if we went from residential property to something even more illiquid, private equity, or something more, more illiquid like, like infrastructure, then instead of an extra 1%, we're gonna be expecting an extra 1.5% for infrastructure, an extra 2.5% per year for private equity. So, these three components adding up to 8.5%. Now, this brings me down to this example, which is where sources of value help us to rule out bad opportunities. So here's what we got. Somebody comes to you and says, I've got an opportunity which will give you 18% return per year. That's what we're expecting to have. 
is there'll be 18% per year. Your money will be locked up for seven to 10 years. You won't be able to get it back. And you, and you think, you, d- you decompose this opportunity into the sources of value. You think, okay, 3% of that 18% is the time value of money. What I could have got for investing in long-term government. And then 2% is because it's very illiquid. Maybe this is a bit more than 2%, but let's go with 2% just because it's very illiquid. That means that 13% is for risk. And that means that this investment is twice as risky as investing in BHP. Now, if the, the, if, if the person offering you this opportunity, if they say to you, oh, no, no, it's not twice as risky as BHP, it's less risky than BHP. Well, you know what to think about that. This is what I mean about ruling out bad opportunities. It's not impossible that someone will come to you with such a high return for something that's less risky than BHP. That's not impossible. But they would have to be someone in your family, someone who you have known since you were in school. It'd have to be something like that. It's not that people don't develop fantastic investment opportunities. It might be that we need $100 million dollars to develop this brilliant opportunity, which is going to deliver returns of 18% or higher. Okay? It's not that that doesn't happen in the economy. It's just that they don't come straight to you and me. They go to the big institutional investors, the Aussie supers and the, and the, uh, and the future funds, and especially they go to the very wealthy families, the Twiggy Forests and the Packers and the, and the Mike Cannon Brooks of the world. They don't come to you and me. And by the time those opportunities make their way down to you and me, they've been rejected by a thousand or more other people who didn't want it. So then you know what to think about. Strangers won't come to you with fabulous opportunities. Like that. I mean, that, that, that could happen, but it has to be someone you've known for a long time. So it's, it, and having this, this way of decomposing sources of value helps to rule out those bad opportunities. Okay, let's move along from that then. Here we're talking about risk and the difference between high risk and high return and growth over time. Here we're talking about diversification, something for nothing, um, less risk and more return, moving in this northwest direction by putting together different investments, Qantas and NAV and CSL in the portfolio, uh, things that don't move in perfect lockstep with each other. Here we're talking about reducing transaction costs and defining what transaction costs are. Here we're talking about who's expert and who's not expert uh, in the in the, the space of um, uh, investment management, uh, wealth management, wealth advice, avoiding complexity, evidence-based decision making. We see lots of examples of that uh, as we go through the course. Okay, investment philosophy. Now let's get into our ten-step self-examination and look at these ten steps. So we start off, of course, by setting our our goals. We need something to head towards and to get that very vivid in our mind uh, and to, to write it down. And then we, to talk it through with somebody else and then to write it down. And we talk about different strategies for really bringing it out. Um, and then, and I should say just before I go on here, that this 10 step program, it's one per week over the 10 weeks. You shouldn't think of it as your homework. You should just think of it as us working through the course basically. And, and, and really working out what's right and what's wrong and bringing you up to speed, putting in place financial control, setting your goals, positioning on the risk spectrum, working out whether there's a disjunction between what you're invested in at the moment and, and where you are on the risk spectrum, getting your strategy together, getting your financial control together. So by the end of the course, you've got a really good, well-functioning investments, uh, investment process. And you'll be brought up to speed and sorted out the things that aren't working know how to, 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 to make choices about implementation. So that takes time. You know, that's why the course goes uh, for 10 weeks. And, and we don't try and do it all in one go. We do one bit per week. And here we, here we can see what those weeks are. First of all, we set goals. Then we work out where we are on the risk spectrum and then what we're currently invested in. And we're looking for a disjunction here. Are we taking an amount of risk that we should be taking? Or are we taking too much? Or are we taking too little? As I was saying before, the most common thing is to be taking too little. But, you know, the most common thing is to be approximately okay. But it's much more common to be taking too little risk than to be taking too much. Okay, and then we're into financial control. Now, 
You might say, why do we go to financial control? Well, it's we need time to set strategy up. We need to learn a lot before we can start doing strategy. So, you know, it, th these are the natural three things to begin with. And then we go to financial control. Are you saving enough? We're looking for whether you're saving enough to reach your goals. Uh, and, and, and often people are saving quite a lot more than they need to reach their goals. Often that's not true, uh, or, or sometimes that's not true. And we talk about what to do about it if it's not true. Uh, but are you saving enough? And we have a calculator for that purpose. Where does the money go? Understanding the money that comes in from your investments and especially from your salary, do you know where it goes? Most people don't. And it makes a huge difference to have uh, good control uh, of, or, and a good understanding of where the money goes. Uh, and so we talk about that in step five. And then we are into strategy. And the two parts of strategy we get into straight away are deciding between where to put your extra savings. We were talking about this earlier, that diagram with the, with the, 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 the white boxes. So your extra savings, what's going to match your circumstances? Paying down your mortgage or contributing more to super or having a negative gearing strategy or establishing a family trust and investing through it or building a business, that's going to be less common, uh, but more common than, than you might think, especially with professional services businesses, people moving from employment to becoming a contractor. That's what I mean by creating a professional services business. You're a software engineer with Telstra, you unplug and become a contractor uh, and create a business in that way. And then you use some of your savings to build up that business. But in any case, here, paying down the mortgage, extra contributions to super, putting in place a negative gearing strategy, establishing a family trust. What's the right combination of these things for you? That's what we're getting to here. Now, choosing asset allocation and leverage, this is the what. Now, a lot of this is the where, but here we've got the what and how. And, and I said it's iterative. You know, we need to work through this and then this and then back to this. So it's an iterative process, but we need to develop enough knowledge to be able to do it. And that's why it appears in classes six and seven. And, and then there's more on the how to manage risk here. And a lot of this is about insurance. This is where we bring in an external expert, Aaron Zellman, another person I've known for a long time and who I rate in terms of highly in terms of integrity and expert knowledge. And so we bring Aaron in to talk about life insurance, but other parts of risk management. So you can see we're right into strategy in this part of the course. Then we're back down to financial control in understanding and thinking through whether you need financial advice or not. Uh, many of you don't. Many of you do. Most, most of you won't have financial advice, but it's a bit 50-50, maybe 60-40. And, and we work it out um, whether that suits you. And then think about how to manage the relationship. And what are the different options? This is what we're working through here. And then we finish up with tax planning. It seems like this and this are exactly the same, but, and there is an element of that. But a lot of this is about tax planning rather than structural. And some of that is you know, it's to do with parents who live overseas. It's to do with making sure that the different uh, um, um, tax planning strategies uh, are understood and can work for you. It's about making sure that You've got your tax strategy to do with your home, your tax strategy to do with superannuation accumulation and then running it down, your tax strategy to do with your wills and estate planning, et cetera, right? And as I said, Brendan Gilley uh, and sometimes his business partner, Stephen Cryer, come to the course for that purpose. So comprehensive 10 steps to work out what's right and what's wrong in your investing and to bring you up to speed. Okay, I probably should speed up a bit here. So knowledge. Knowledge in terms of asset classes, this is actually how we progress through the course. There's a lot going on in the background with structuring and tax planning, as I said previously, and with our 10-step program. But course by, class by class, we talk about stocks, then real estate, then bonds, then infrastructure, then private equity. And we really go deep on it. And we understand historical returns. We understand different types of products in the market, like hybrid bonds and exchange-traded funds and Fixed rate, option, fixed rate mortgages versus floating rate mortgages, et cetera. All kinds of different products. We understand all the different types of participants, especially those who can provide you with advice, but others as well, like investment platforms and, and different companies. 
different structures, family trusts, self-managed super funds, corporations, professional services, businesses, different everything to do with tax um, that, that we need in, in, as private investors, and then an amount of finance fundamentals. Now, this is not the, the overlap between the courses that I teach at the Melbourne Business School and this personal investing course is actually very small. But you know, I teach the, the, the risk management slash financial engineering course. I haven't taught that for a few years, but I teach that, I teach introductory finance, I teach corporate finance, I teach my financial institutions course um, at the business school. None of them are about household investing, but all of them and, and this course are built on the same uh, coherent financial principles. And, and a lot of that comes out in the course. I don't assume you know any of that, of course, as I've said uh, more than once already, but a lot of that comes out uh, in the course. And that's what I mean by finance fundamentals uh, down here. So let me move through those. And then here, I'm just showing you what some of those things look like as we work in, in the, you know, what, what do self-managed super funds with, with different, um, sorry, I should be more complete here. The, the, the dominance of resources, the dominance by resource stocks, miners and financials, banks, how much they dominate the Aussie stock exchange and therefore the need to own foreign shares to achieve diversification, to get exposure to tech and pharmaceuticals and manufacturing and the like. The, here we're looking at the, the different asset allocation within self-managed super funds for, for self-managed super funds that hold different amounts of money. Here we're looking at different ways of implementing investments in, in shares. And many of the things that I was talking about earlier, managed funds and listed investment companies and exchange traded funds and different types of brokerage. And here we're looking at financial planning networks and really explaining the different parts of financial planner networks and how financial planners are organized into dealer groups. And then here we're looking at an example of a family trust set up by Evie and Carl Lamb. Here we're looking at what looks incredibly complicated, but actually this diagram draws itself in the course. And so it's a whole lot of building blocks, but it brings out an important idea about self-managed super funds owning commercial property. Here we're talking about the tax nature of negative gearing in, in, in which negative gearing turns income, the losses turns income into, um, uh, into capital gains. I'm not pretending I've explained what's going on here. I'm just showing you that we have a lot of high quality dynamic slides used to explain everything uh, in finance. In investing, here we're talking about short selling. Here we're talking about uh, the margins on the issue date in hybrid notes, et cetera. Now, there, there, there's a lot of slides and a lot of them have a lot of text in them. We don't look at them in the class. And, and really, you don't need to look at them at all. But a lot of people want to reference uh, and, and to go deeper. Uh, and so. There's a lot of slides that, that have text as well as, uh, as what are mostly diagrams and, and graphs and things, very intuitive. Now we work through narratives in the course. And so we have three main fictional narratives. So we have Ravi and Jess who are a young couple, a 30 something couple with children. Here we're looking at them forming their, at Ravi and Jess creating their, their, um, their goals. And then we have Brooke, who was a single in her mid forties and, and we're looking at, at her circumstances. And then here we have David and, and Beck, Beck and David, I should say, uh, who are an older couple. And we follow them through the 10 steps. And then down here, we have the class by class topics. So I won't take you through them, but we do, you'll have the slide pack. And uh, here we have what's in the 10, the, the, the topics of the 10 classes. Here we have the, 10 step self-examination of your investing. Now I'm gonna pause on each of the 10 classes here uh, so that you can pause the video if you wanna see what's in these 10 classes and you don't have the slide pack that goes with this video with you. So these are our 10 step, uh, this is our 10 step program. Some of these steps go together. Are we saving enough to meet our goals? Do, is our current asset allocation, does it match where we are on the risk spectrum? We're looking for disjunctions there. So then we're into our classes. So here's our first class about risk and returns and really setting up the whole of the course with some fundamental ideas and setting of goals. And then we're into stock market fundamentals. So we do start from the beginning, but then we go quickly to really understand what's going on in the stock market. Then we position you on the risk spectrum. 
And then we have implementing stock market investment. And this is where we, we get rolling on family trusts with a long example of Evie and Carl Lamb setting up a family trust with a corporate beneficiary, a bucket company. You know, family trusts sound complicated and expensive, but actually they're not either of those things. And that's what I mean by they're overdone. And, you know, the number of people who've taken the course and been amazed that they don't have a family trust or that their accountant hasn't helped them with that uh, is, I couldn't tell you how many that is, but it's a lot. In any case, we're working out your asset allocation in step three. And then we're implementing stock market investment. So we're looking at products. We're looking at, at the, the different implementation options that we were talking about before and really working through them. Um, and here we're looking at whether you're saving enough in our 10 step program. Then we get started on residential property and understanding the pros and cons of rep residential property and really going deep on understanding negative gearing properly and think about residential property in general as a strategy. Then we introduce commercial property. I should say right at this point that, that commercial property, we talk a lot about commercial property in the course. Now, people are much more familiar, private investors um, are much more familiar with residential property than they are with commercial property. But commercial property has made people a lot more money than residential property over time. And the headwinds that commercial property faces are, are, are lower than those of residential property. You'll see in the course when we talk about strategy in houses and apartments that there are some significant headwinds for residential property. And of course, this is where we get going on, on strategy in our 10 step program. And then we're into fixed income. Uh, and, and down here, alternative asset classes, meaning infrastructure and private equity, uh, et cetera. Then we're into insurance. And we also have a section on negotiating properly. It makes a huge difference to negotiate properly in private investing. Um, but, we're, but we're mostly talking about life insurance and other forms of risk management uh, here. Then we're into getting value from your financial advisor and whether you need a financial advisor in the, in the ninth step. And then we're into, into structuring and tax planning, um, bringing, us to, uh, bringing us to the end of the course. And I really do hope to see you um, on the course. Uh, we will, you know, you won't regret it. People absolutely love the course. We just love the feeling of empowerment and of getting traction. You'll love it too. So hope to see you on the course soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.